guys and welcome back or if you're new here hi my name's georgia and on my platforms here on the internet i talk about true crime a lot of the time i tend to focus on unsolved cases unsolved murders unidentified people cold cases sometimes i talk about solved cases solved murders serial killers things like that but today we've got something a little bit different this definitely still falls under the umbrella of true crime but today we're going to be talking about fraud and a man who faked his own death Today's episode is going to take us on a wild ride into the story of John Darwin, a man who disappeared at sea in March 2002. A search found no body, just his canoe washed up on shore in pieces. And then, five years later, he walks into a police station claiming he has amnesia. He can't remember anything from the last seven years. But of course, his story soon unravels around him as investigators begin to look into it. This sounds like the stuff of movies, it's almost unbelievable that somebody thinks they'd be able to get away with something like this in real life. But John Darwin almost did, he almost successfully faked his own death. Just greed got in the way. As a lot of stories like this one tend to start, John Darwin was just a normal man with a normal family, a normal house in Seton Carew in Hartlepool in the northeast of England. He had a wife, Anne Darwin, and two adult sons, Mark and Anthony. He'd worked as a teacher for nearly two decades for later, rather ironically, becoming a prison officer. John and Anne also ran a business renting bedsits across County Durham and they owned 12 rental houses in total. That's a pretty big rental empire and it should have been bringing in pretty good money for the couple. Only it wasn't. And if there's one thing you need to know about John Darwin, it's that he loved money. His main motivation in life was always to be rich, to not have to worry about where your money is coming from. And like, I think a lot of us can sympathise with that. I think we all agree that life is a lot less stressful when you don't have to worry about where your money's coming from. But hey, that's just capitalism for you. But John Darwin went one step above. He was this man obsessed with becoming a millionaire. For him, money equaled success, and that was it. An article in The Guardian from 2008 describes how ex-colleagues at the prison service referred to John as obsessed with money, introverted, and boring. One ex-colleague saying how he constantly spoke about his property development business and his rental properties. He was always more concerned with his businesses, his money-making schemes outside of work than actually focusing on his actual job which he may have been able to progress in a bit more if he actually cared about it, but he didn't. And his property development wasn't John's only step on the ladder to millionairedom. He had other plans. He had plans to breed snails, to make garden gnomes, to run market stalls, to write computer games, even try to join the stock market. But he could never quite apply himself to any of these and make it work. He simply wasn't a businessman, but he wanted money. A couple of years before his disappearance, around the year 2000, John and Anne bought a house in Seton Carew, right on the beachfront. It was number three, the cliff, and they also bought its neighbouring house as well, number four. Through the cliff was this beautiful house with a beautiful view and a perfect location for John's favourite hobby, canoeing. It was right on the beachfront. But soon it became pretty hard for the couple to enjoy the life they'd built for themselves because they were hurtling into debt. Now you would think that one of the most basic steps of being a landlord and renting out houses is to ensure that the monthly rental payments you're receiving cover the cost of the mortgage and the other bills. If you want this to be a business, that is step number one. I mean, even if you're morally against rentals and landlords, you have to know that. Like if somebody wants to do it for a business, they've got to cover the mortgage. But somehow the Darwins missed that step. The income they were making from their rental properties simply wasn't covering the costs. And with each passing month, they were getting closer and closer to having to declare bankruptcy with debts of £64,000. It got to the point that they even had to sell off a couple of their houses. Just months before John's disappearance, they sold a detached house in Whitton Gilbert near Durham for £70,000, but it still wasn't enough to get them out of the hole they dug for themselves. Now, for most people, this is going to be a horrible situation to be in. The feeling of being in debt is really suffocating. It's a really scary place to be. But for John, it came with this extra layer. This was a man obsessed with the idea of becoming a millionaire by the time he was 50. All his self-worth was placed on how much money he had. And to the outside world, he did appear to be doing well for himself. Like he drove a £48,000 Range Rover, for God's sake. He had a personalised number plate. But he was drowning in debt. 
Now, I'm not claiming to know the ins and outs of the debts that Darwin's found themselves in. I really couldn't find details of it online. I could only assume it wasn't quite as simple as just selling off some properties or the expensive car to get themselves out of it. If it was, I can't imagine John would have done what he did next. It very much seems like a last ditch effort kind of thing. Because on Thursday the 21st of March 2002, John Darwin finished a night shift at Home House Prison in Stockton and returned home to Seton Carew. Sources do tend to differ on the exact timing of this next point, but at some point, I think in the mid-afternoon, he left the house and walked down to the seafront with his red kayak in hand, his kayak that he nicknamed Orca. Now, this case is often referred to as the canoe man case, but I actually think the canoe in question was a kayak. Although they're very similar things, and I'm sure people will correct me in the comments, a canoe is generally open and you use a one-bladed paddle, whilst a kayak is closed, you sort of sit inside the boat with your legs stretched out along the body, and you use a double-bladed paddle. The distinction isn't really relevant to the story, I just know that John headed out on the sea on his own in his canoe slash kayak, and then he disappeared. A neighbour would later report having seen him head out there and that was a witness to the fact that he went out to sea and then never came home. At 9.30pm that night, Anne calls the police to report her husband as missing, telling them that he'd gone into the sea and not returned. He'd failed to arrive back at the prison for work on the night shift. An article I found online from this time on BBC News dated Friday the 22nd of March 2002 reads... Four lifeboats, two Coast Guard rescue teams from Hartlepool and Redcar, a police fixed wing aircraft with heat seeking equipment and teams of police officers have been involved in this search. In that first day, rescuers searched a 62 square mile area of the sea from Hartlepool in the north to States in the south and up to 10 miles out to sea through the night. At 1.15am in the morning, a double-ended paddle used by people in kayaks like John's was retrieved from the sea near North Gare, so not far from Seaton Carew. A spokesperson said, if a canoeist loses his oar and cannot retrieve it, he is at the mercy of the sea and currents and has to sit out until he's rescued. Normally these people wear the right sort of protective clothing and we hope this is the case in this instance. We have got to remain optimistic that he is found. But despite exhaustive searches, they don't find John and they call off the search by the Friday night. Weeks later, his battered canoe would wash up on the beach and it was assumed by all that he'd got into trouble in the water and had sadly died. Hopefully at some point his body might wash up and they can get closure, but Anne was now a widow, their sons without a father. It was confusing to experts though because the conditions of the water that day weren't that bad. An experienced canoeist or kayaker like John Darwin shouldn't have found himself in any trouble on this water. It was pretty calm and he knew the safety procedures. The water was later described by John himself as not flat calm but not too rough. As in likely believable that somebody could get themselves into trouble without actually putting themselves in danger. Even so, the authorities truly believed he was lost at sea forever, and within just six months of the accident, Anne Darwin was calling herself a widow and was in the process of claiming his life insurance money. But of course, without a body and no immediate death certificate, the claiming of the insurance was a little bit more complicated. There had to be an inquest into his disappearance, with the court declaring it an open verdict, but eventually he was legally declared as dead, finally allowing Anne to claim £250,000 in insurance from a variety of sources. That's his life insurance policy, his teacher's pension, his prison service pension, payouts from the Department of Pensions, and £137,000 for their Norwich Union mortgage insurance policy. And later she would receive another payment as well, bringing the total money received over the entire course of this to £679,000. The insurance companies were pretty happy with the evidence of a death certificate and the washed up canoe. Anne was a bereaved widow and she certainly played this part really well. She deserved the money, it allowed her to pay off their debts and live in comfort. She didn't need any more upset. And lots of people thought that's where this story would end. Bar coverage when John very first disappeared, this wasn't really a story that was picked up by the media or drew much attention. I mean, why would it? It was sad, but these things sadly do happen. John just went out to sea and disappeared. And Anne and their sons went on with their lives, his sons genuinely believing that their father had tragically died. But then, on December the 1st, 2007, over five years since the day he disappeared, John Darwin walks into a police station in central London and tells police, I think I'm a missing person. 
He claims he has amnesia and can't remember anything that's happened over the previous seven years. That's since the year 2000, two years before he went missing. And this is where the tale becomes a media sensation, because of course the police didn't believe him. It became clear very quickly that his story just did not add up. A spokesman for the Cleveland police, the police who had been responsible for the original search in 2002 said, Mr. Darwin identified himself as a missing person from Hartlepool. He is fit and well and relatives have been informed of his whereabouts. It is not known at this time where he has spent the last five and a half years. He was able to provide details of his name, date of birth and a few personal things, but claimed he had no idea where he'd been. But it turns out that at the time John walked into the station, police had already been having their doubts about his and Anne's story. Just three months beforehand, a financial investigation had already begun into Anne, as she had drawn quite a bit of attention by deciding to emigrate to Panama, selling their seat and crew home in what seemed to be one hell of a rush and just disappearing, transferring large sums of money abroad. Sure, maybe she was a grieving widow wanting to start a new life abroad, but something just didn't feel right and people paid attention. The person who bought through the cliff of a van said that she left so quickly that she left a huge amount of furniture behind. She couldn't even be bothered to pack or sell her belongings properly. She told her sons that she wanted to move to Panama as it was fun, Catholic, and they speak Spanish. And her sons didn't really question it because at the end of the day, they just wanted their widowed mother to be happy. They knew better than anyone that life was too short. To the authorities though, it all just seemed a little bit weird. And then John reappears. So just four days after his miraculous reappearance, John Darwin is arrested at his son's home in Basingstoke on suspicion of fraud. Now his sons originally said they were overjoyed at having their father back. I mean, it was nothing short of a miracle they thought. But as the true story came to light, they realized that they'd been scammed as well. And they said they wished to have no further contact with their parents. Investigation did really quickly find they had no knowledge of what had been going on. So they were completely innocent. After his arrest, John is taken back up north where he's questioned by the Cleveland police. And then just a couple of days later, on the 6th of December 2007, photos are published by the Daily Mirror showing John in Panama City in July 2006. And not only that, Anne is stood by his side. The photos have been found by an anonymous woman who simply typed John, Anne and Panama into Google and came across a photo of the pair on a website called movetopanama.com. The photo also featured Mario Villar, the president and managing director of movepanama.com, which is a relocation and land agent company. He would later explain how John had contacted him about his relocation services after him and his partner had decided to move there. They thought Panama would be a safe haven for them, a place to settle and enjoy their money. After they met that day, Mario asked if the two could pose for a photo for his website, and for whatever wild reason, they agreed. Perhaps they were put on the spot and couldn't come up with an excuse quickly enough, but surely the first rule of faking your own death is not taking photos, especially photos you know are going to end up online. When Anne found out about the photo, apparently her only response was simply, my sons will never forgive me. She was arrested on the 9th of December at Manchester Airport as she arrived back into the UK, telling investigators that she did believe initially that her husband had died in the canoeing accident and only realised he was alive when he got in touch with her many years later, a story which was quickly found, of course, to be false. And just like John was charged on suspicion of fraud and both of them were formally convicted on the 23rd of July 2008. But let's go back a bit. What really happened here? Let's start at the very beginning, on the day that John Darwin disappeared. Now, he really did take his canoe out into the sea that day, but obviously nothing bad happened. What actually took place were the first steps in a deeply thought out plan. He paddled down to the first pier south of Seton Carew and exited the canoe or the kayak, and then he just pushed it back out to sea. Earlier that afternoon, he had called Anne, telling her that he was going to go out in the canoe, carrying out the first steps of the plan that they'd been discussing for quite a while. He asked her to pick him up in the car park at North Gair and take him to Durham train station, where he would board a train and escape the area, at least for a little bit until it all blew over. 
Turns out that this plan had been in the works for quite a while. Now, John insisted to Anne that before calling the police, she had to call the prison to ask if he turned up to work. When they said no, that was when she could report him as missing, which she did so at 9.30pm. And from there, the lies would just snowball. They were immediately in too deep here. Over £100,000 were spent on this search out at sea, 40 lives of search and rescue crew were put at risk. I mean, nobody died in the search, but imagine if they had, like how do you make peace with that for the sake of an insurance scam because you refused to declare bankruptcy? Anne said that she didn't expect the search to be of that scale, but like, of course it would be. He was missing at sea. So that is the first step completed. The seeds of John Darwin being dead at sea have been sown. But what on earth do you do next? Honestly, if somebody asked me to fake my own death, I would have literally zero idea how to go about it. But doing it at sea is quite smart. There are very few methods of death in which you don't expect to find a body, and that is one of them. John's next step was somehow get a new identity, so he visits a local register office and orders a copy of somebody else's birth certificate, giving the details of a baby who had sadly died just a few weeks after his birth in 1950. John had found this identity after trawling through historical obituaries in the local library. The baby was named John Jones and John decided that choosing the same first name was of vital importance. He wouldn't have to sort of like rewire his brain into responding to an entirely new name. And it's not like John was an uncommon first name in this time, they're ten a penny. So John Jones, it was. John Jones' state of birth was also pretty similar to Darwin's own because he knew he had to pass for around the same age. He would later say in his police interview that he chose the identity of somebody who was dead because he didn't want to ruin somebody else's life by committing identity theft. And I get it, like he's committing fraud but it is a relatively victimless crime. The big insurance companies can afford to lose the money, nobody is hurt in this process, maybe apart from his own sons. The Darwins didn't actively seek out to hurt people in the process of this, which is probably how they justified it in their own minds. They just wanted to get out of debt. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm sort of like justifying the actions here, crime is crime at the end of the day, but this wasn't an evil sociopath of a man. He didn't want to actively hurt anyone by taking their identity. So he chose a dead baby. However, when John Jones' family would eventually find out about their relationship's identity being used for something like this, they were understandably devastated. I mean, John was just a five-week-old baby when he died. He was a son, a brother, a grandson. He had people who loved him. I would be devastated if somebody used one of my past relatives' identities for such a thing. Like, this is so... you can't even imagine it. John Jones was still a person who was incredibly loved, and he never got a chance to form an identity of his own, and now here was John Darwin taking it. But now John Darwin was John Jones. He had no issues getting hold of a new birth certificate, a system which I'm really hoping has changed since 2002. And he was still living with Anne at Three the Cliff. That's right, he just moved back into his home. If you remember, the couple also owned the adjoining house, number four the Cliff, and so when friends or family came around to visit, John would simply pop through a small hidden door between the houses and wait in the attic next door until the coast was clear. You might think John would have gone a bit stir crazy being stuck in the house for an undetermined amount of time, like what do you do when you're supposed to be dead? Humans need to get out and socialise and breathe fresh air. But John didn't just stick around the house. Once the news settled around his disappearance, he would just go out with a grown beard and a hat pulled down over his face. As I said earlier, his disappearance wasn't exactly countrywide news. It was townwide news for a bit, it was sad, and then people moved on. Most people wouldn't have recognised his face, so he could go out and about, and the only issue was if he ran into somebody that he knew, but nobody suspected anything. Of course though, even this takes its toll, and by 2004, John is bored of hiding away, and now he has a shit ton of money to spend as well. He is finally rich. To pass the time whilst hidden away, he got really into a computer game called Ashton's Call, a fantasy role-playing game where thousands of players inhabit a beautiful 3D fantasy world to make friends and seek out perilous adventures. John spent hours on this game, losing himself in the fantasy world as a druid. And through it, he met an American woman called Kelly Steele, who was in her early 40s, living in Kansas City. 
Soon, John and Kelly become good friends. They communicate via email and through chatting in the game. John hides the other half of his conversations from Anne by wearing his headphones. Through speaking to Kelly, Kansas was really a place that captured John's attention. He noted that you could get a lot of bang for your buck there where property was concerned. Vast amounts of wide open spaces, lots of land on which to build and buy homes. It was the perfect place for him to expand his property empire, and now he had loads of money to do so. He wanted to buy a cattle ranch, he decided, and asked Kelly if she wanted to go into business with him, and she agreed. The idea was that John would buy an old rundown ranch and Kelly would run it for him. John would just be a silent investor over in the UK and Kelly would sort of send him money. John actually wired her the money over to make the purchase and she said that she didn't realise that he was being serious until the money arrived in her bank account. That's a lot of trust to have in a person who you met online in a fantasy role playing game. He sent her thousands of pounds. Also around this time, the exchange rate was wild. I think it was around $2 to every pound. So buying property in the USA would have been really, really appealing. It would have been so cheap for John. Eventually he decides that he should probably head over to Kansas himself to just see what Kelly was doing, see what he was buying. And so he did so under a new passport in the name of John Jones. Yes, he was able to get a passport in John Jones's name. Kelly, however, really quickly began having doubts, saying that as soon as John arrived, he seemed very on edge. I mean, this whole situation is just wild, isn't it? Meeting somebody online, trusting them enough to send them huge amounts of money to buy property on your behalf, and only then flying out to see them. Kelly described John as very odd, saying that once he arrived at her house, she told him to go and put his luggage in her daughter's room where he would be staying. I can only assume the daughter was staying elsewhere at this time. She then says that just 10 minutes later, she's in the kitchen and can hear something going on in the bedroom. So she peeks around the corner and sees John getting undressed with the door wide open in full view of everyone, like he's taking down his trousers. She very quickly then takes him to stay at a local hotel instead, which is very strange behavior and it would only get stranger from there. But Kelly and John were already in business together. They'd already bought a rundown property worth $26,500, on which he planned to have an equestrian center and a cattle ranch. It needed to be completely redone, basically stripped back down to basics and rebuilt whilst Kelly did the work and he sat as a silent partner. That was what was supposed to happen. But once he arrived in Kansas, he decided that he was gonna stick around and work on the ranch himself, to which Kelly said no. He also said he wanted to stay and live in the town which Kelly also said no. People around the small town the ranch we were in found him really, really odd. She said that he was very unsettling, people didn't really like him. So Kelly eventually had to tell him to leave town, so he headed back to Sleepy Seat and Crew and she worked on the ranch, or she was supposed to be working on the ranch. However, now he'd had a taste of being out in the world and he couldn't settle back home. He knew that freedom awaited him elsewhere and people were beginning to notice him. He was spotted by a former colleague at the prison and police actually contacted Anne about this, to which she said that the colleague must have made a mistake. John had cousins who looked just like him. The next door tenant of For the Cliff also recognised him at one point and asked him if he was supposed to be dead. John apparently just warned him not to tell anyone about it and at the time, I don't think the tenant did. I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? You're not exactly taught what to do in school. I'm sure you'd just convince yourself that you'd made a mistake and it's not worth bothering the police about. But John knew his time in Seaton Crew was coming to an end and now he wanted to live somewhere warmer. In 2004, John and Anne visited Cyprus. They intended to buy some land out there. They went for a week, they looked at a number of properties but decided against pursuing it any further because it would just be a long and very laborious process and would probably draw attention to them. They just didn't have the value of time here. So the next year, in 2005, they travelled to Gibraltar to view a 60-foot catamaran being sold by a dealer called Robert Hopkin. Hopkin would later recall how John Jones contacted him for the catamaran, intending to live aboard it long-term with his partner. He said he wanted to be able to sail across the oceans and live entirely self-sufficiently, which sounds like a perfect plan for a man who's supposed to be dead, who's going to recognise them at sea. However, the catamaran in question was very old. It was over three decades old and needed a lot of work doing to make it habitable. And it was expensive at 60,000 pounds. So they managed to haggle it down to about half price, I think, with the owners having to do a lot of work on it beforehand before the Darwins would actually send the money. When the Darwins headed back to Seaton Crew, the sale of the catamaran was still in process and Hopkins started to receive a number of emails from John, making more and more demands before they went through with the sale. 
It got to the point that Hopkins said he didn't even want John to buy this boat anymore. It was more hassle than it was worth. He was being so unreasonable. His emails read as if he was a man beginning to lose the plot. He didn't seem entirely based in reality. So Anne and John were back in Seton Crew, no closer to moving abroad, but they still had the property in Kansas, which was around halfway finished. Kelly said around this time that John seemed to be getting very anxious, that the renovation was taking way too long, and he started to demand his half of the investment back immediately. Now, Kelly couldn't get the money together to send over to him, like this just wasn't part of the deal. Every penny they had was tied up in the property, and they couldn't sell it until it was finished. And soon it would turn out that John had a dark side, with him sending Kelly a number of very strange and threatening messages. Threatening to kill her and her family, to torture them, to hurt her animals, to burn the property down. He even claimed to know a New York gangster who had photos of Kelly and her daughter. If she wouldn't send the money to him immediately, they would be killed. In his isolation, had he just forgotten how to act like a normal person? I mean, this was clearly fiction. A New York gangster is something out of a Hollywood movie, but obviously it did rattle Kelly. He was threatening her kids. In all my research, I couldn't really find anyone else describing him as acting in such a dark way. Odd, for sure, money obsessed, definitely, but nothing else quite like this. John was clearly losing the plot. It is really, really hard to be on the run, to be legally dead. John had to develop an entirely new life. He was trapped. Anything he did required a hell of a lot of planning and thinking through. And that's an incredibly isolating place to be. And I'm not saying this because I have sympathy. He did this to himself. I'm just saying that is the headspace he would have been in at this time. It must really wear a person down. And now he was desperate and acting out. Some people online do seem to think that maybe Kelly did scam him out of his money, maybe she did, I don't know, but you can't say it wouldn't have been his own fault. Moving into 2006, John is now spending a lot of time online trying to figure out his next move, like where would he be able to go, where can he be free, buy land and be rich? And then one day he comes up with Panama, a country linking Central and South America with plenty of land, beautiful beaches and cities. And its legal and tax structures also make it a pure tax haven. Google telling me that Panama imposes no income, corporate, capital gains or estate taxes on offshore entities. It also has very strict banking secrecy laws designed to protect the privacy of account holders. Perfect for somebody who's supposed to be dead. So in July 2006, John and Anne contact a Panama-based estate agent called Diana Bishop about finding a local property. The pair then travel out there and meet Diana, and Anne introduces John as her partner or friend, but never says husband. Anne even says that she was a widow and spoke openly about her two sons, whilst John always stayed quiet. It was around this time they also took the notorious photo with Mario of MovedPanama.com, the photo that would end up being their downfall. Diane would eventually show the couple a 481 acre plot of land in a town called Escobal, about two hours from Panama City, and they fell in love. This was simply just virgin scrubland, jungle, on a lake, no running water or electricity, but it was big and they were very interested. They actually even took a number of photos on this land that they hoped would one day be theirs. They dreamed of building their dream house and a thriving business, wanting to build an eco lodge for tourists and also run canoeing holidays on the lake. Yes, you heard that right. Although in a later interview, John would say that the canoe rental part of the story was fabricated by the media who just wanted to sort of like play into the story of him faking his own death. I really wouldn't put it past the British media, so honestly, he may well be telling the truth there. Obviously, the process of moving abroad is a very slow one. They first visited Panama in mid-2006, then they went back to visit in March 2007, which is when they started a company called Jaguar Properties and bought a small two-bed apartment in Panama City that they could kind of stay in whilst they did up this land. Around this time, they also sold For The Cliff, which was now under their son Mark's name. They transferred the deeds to his name the year before, but the process from the sale were sent straight over to Panama. In May 2007, John and Anne paid $390,000, so £200,000, for the land in Escobar, and soon it was going to be theirs. Returning to the UK, Anne started the process of selling their seat and crew home in a huge rush to get rid of it, and in July 2007, they went back to Panama for six more weeks. They transferred all of their cash over to Panama into the very secret bank accounts that they have over there. 
In this time, they were constantly to and from the UK sorting out their affairs, or Anne was sorting out her affairs, I suppose, because John was dead. The Seaton crew home was officially sold in October 2007 and Anne left for Panama for good. Towards the end of November, the couple went on holiday to Costa Rica and then went back to Panama. But by the 30th of November, Anne was buying John a plane ticket back to the UK because apparently he was complaining of missing their sons. Now, if this is true, I have no idea what the game plan was here. He said he missed his sons, he missed his home, and so he just jumps on a plane. I don't know if he had a plan of action for when he arrived. I don't know if the intention was just to go and knock on his son's front doors and be like, hey, surprise, I'm alive. But he soon starts claiming to have amnesia and we all know what happened next. On the 1st of December, he walks into the West End London Central Police Station and tells them he's a missing person. Of course, after just a tiny bit of scrutiny from the police, it would turn out the motivation for returning to the UK was never the sons. There had actually been a kink in their Panama plans. Panama had recently changed their visa laws, meaning that their identities were gonna have to be verified by UK police before they could get their investors' visas and move there for good. They knew the jig was up. John's John Jones passport was never gonna be able to pass this level of scrutiny. They were gonna get caught either way, so he returned and faked the amnesia, just a last ditch attempt to get away with it. Three days later, John's arrested and then Anne comes back to the country and she's also arrested. The investigation into them did move pretty fast because as I mentioned earlier in the episode, the police had already begun to suspect that something was up thanks to Anne's very sudden departure and a very suspicious phone call overheard by one of Anne's colleagues in September 2007. So they did have a bit of a head start. In March 2008, John admits to seven charges of obtaining cash by deception, as well as a passport offence charge. He also had nine charges of using criminal property, which he denied, but these charges were ordered by the judge to lie on file, which here in the UK means there's probably enough evidence for the charges to go forward, but it's just not really in the public's best interest to push forward with that prosecution. I mean, especially in this case, where there were much bigger charges to push and focus on. Because he did admit guilt, John didn't have to stand trial and at sentencing on the 23rd of July 2008, he was convicted of fraud and the passport charge and was sentenced to six years and three months in prison. It wasn't that long a sentence, but again, I do refer to the fact that technically nobody was hurt. Sure, it was a big crime, lots of police hours wasted, insurance companies scammed, but no singular person was harmed and that's reflected in the sentencing. And he also admitted to the crimes, which also would have been reflected. I'm not saying necessarily that I agree with the length of the sentence, but I'm just saying that would have been sort of the judge's mindset in setting that sentence. Anne did not admit to her crimes and she denied six charges of deception and nine of using criminal property. She was described by the police as being a compulsive liar and she blamed most of her actions on her husband, although she did ultimately go along with it all. I don't know here, I can't imagine being in a situation where me and my soon to be wife are on the brink of filing for bankruptcy and instead allowing my wife to convince me to fake her death instead. Now I don't claim to know the ins and outs and dynamics of the Darwin's relationship of course, but Anne went along with this and she had many opportunities to come forward over the years. She chose not to, so I don't think she can blame it all on John. In the end, she was sentenced to six years and six months in prison, which is a longer sentence than what John got. I'm sure he did get leniency for admitting to his crimes. If he went to trial, I imagine his sentence would have been longer. But in the end, they were both released on probation only a couple of years into their sentences, in January and March 2011, respectively. They were also told that all the profits they made from the scam would be confiscated, of course. John told the media, of course I regret doing the crime. I regret actually coming back. Coming back, I've lost everything. I've lost the person I was in love with. I've lost any sort of hope that I can have a comfortable retirement. I did have two pensions. They've been taken off me. Instead of paying the insurance back, the courts wanted every penny we had. The papers say we still have stashes of money here, there and everywhere. We don't. I owed £700,000. Pounds, I still owe £700,000. Which to me sounds like a whole lot of poor me and no admission of your wrongdoing. Like of course they're going to take back the money, of course they are. By February 2012, the Crown Prosecution Service did announce the entire life insurance and pension payouts received by Anne Darwin had been recovered, mostly from the sale of the two properties in Panama. 
And then in April 2014, it was reported that John had only paid back just £121 from the £679,000 the judge had ordered him personally to repay. However, this was apparently because all of the assets were in Anne's name because John was, well, dead. By July 2015, they no longer had any assets and they repaid over half a million of what they owed. So they did pay back the majority of what they owed, but I think there's still a chunk remaining to this very day. So, where are the Darwins today? You'll probably be unsurprised to hear that their marriage didn't last this ordeal and they ended up divorcing, with John citing unreasonable behaviours as the reason. As of an article from The Chronicle Live from June 2023, Anne did go on to write a book called Out of My Death about what happened. She apparently claimed in the book that she was coerced into the scam and it just got out of control. She said to The Guardian in 2016, the deeper you get into these situations, the harder it is to get out. If I had any inkling, it would have lasted more than a few weeks. There's no way I could have gone along with it and put myself through years of torture. But once it was done and he got me to lie that he disappeared, I couldn't get out of it. As of early 2022, she was living in a village not far from Middlesbrough and a documentary was aired claiming that Anne had reconciled with her sons, who were obviously enormously hurt by this whole thing. I can't imagine what parents would put their own children through such huge pain just for money. I don't know if I'd ever personally be able to forgive that, but perhaps her sons are better people than me. As for John, according to articles from April and May last year, he has managed to find new love and he now lives in the Philippines with his new wife, about half an hour outside of Manila. He receives a UK state pension of just £134 a week. I'm amazed he was even allowed any pension after his conviction, but I suppose they can't not give it to him. What I'm taking away from this is how small that state pension is. Like £134 a week is hardly enough to live on currently in the UK, like for the average pensioner. But I suppose John doesn't have to worry about that in the Philippines with his new wife, Mercy May, who has said that she has her own business and is making very good money. Mercy is 23 years younger than John and they married in 2015 after meeting online. John loves to meet women online apparently. Mercy has said that John doesn't like to be reminded of his past and I'm sure he doesn't. It's no wonder he left the UK because this became a pretty massive story. This was the front page of all the newspapers. It was spoken about for months on end. But he did it to himself. His own choices led him here and sometimes you've just got to live with the consequences of your own actions. I am very intrigued to see what all of you think about this case in the comment section down below. Do you think that sentence was long enough? Do you think it should have been longer? Do you think it should have been less? Like, how bad is this crime on the scale of crimes? Like, true, nobody was hurt. It's still a massive crime. Like, you can't have people just going around scamming insurance companies left, right and centre because... That's not how society works. In this whole story, the people that I feel for most are their sons. I can't imagine living through something like this. It must have been so unbelievably painful. And I really hope they've made peace with what happened by this point. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you know of any other cases which may be similar to this one that you'd like me to talk about, then let me know in the comments down below. I found this one so interesting to research and honestly, it's quite a nice break sometimes not researching really dark, horrible things. Like it can get quite heavy just looking at murders and unidentified people all the time. It's, it's a lot on the old brain, but it was quite a nice break to do something like this. Thank you always for all your support and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.